It's all fun and games until Medicosis starts teaching pharmacology. What is going on, wonderful people? It's Medicosis Perfectionators, where medicine makes perfect sense. Today is an important day because we'll talk about an introduction to pharmacology. In this video, you'll understand what general pharmacology is, which includes pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. You will learn about autonomic pharmacology, neuropharmacology, which is pharmacology of the central nervous system, and of course the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. We will talk about metabolism of medications and their elimination. In many a case, it's the kidney that eliminates the medication. We'll talk about cardiac pharmacology. We'll talk about medications for asthma and other respiratory diseases. We will briefly discuss renal pharmacology, GI pharmacology, and endocrine pharmacology. So click the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. This is my pharmacology playlist. It has more than 250 videos about every single pharmacology topic that you can imagine. This playlist begins with a bunch of miscellaneous subjects to get you interested in pharmacology. Once you start loving pharmacology, you will cruise through medicine like a sharp knife in warm butter. So what are we going to talk about today? We'll talk about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Together we call them general pharmacology. Everything else is systemic pharmacology because we deal with systems. This is the autonomic nervous system. This is the central nervous system pharmacology, cardiovascular pharmacology, endocrine pharmacology, anti-cancer pharmacology, namely chemotherapy, toxicology. What happens if I take too much? Utacoid pharmacology, and I'll tell you what utacoid means and what eicosanoid means. And then antibiotics, or preferably antimicrobials, because antimicrobials is a more inclusive term that includes antibacterials, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitic medications. Once we finish this video, if you want to take it to the next level, I have a special course about each one of these pharmacology subjects on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. You can download these courses and keep them for you forever. My website is medicosisperfectionalis.com. If you have studied physics before, you will recall that kinema means motion. First things first, medicosis symbols for pharmacology. When I use the symbol, it means the clinical uses of the medications. But when I use this, it means the side effects or the adverse effects of the medication. This means resistance. For example, the bacteria can resist your medication, rendering it ineffective. This sad liver means that the medication is toxic to the liver or hepatotoxic. This Sad kidney means that the medication is nephrotoxic. This gear means the mechanism of action of the medication. This means contraindications of the medication. Look at this running action for mechokinetics motion. This is an oral pill or tablet. This is an intravenous medication. This is an intramuscular medication. This is under the skin subcutaneous medication. This is a topical medication. This is a transdermal patch. Drug plus drug equals danger, so drug-drug interaction. This is a gram-positive coccus, this is a gram-positive rod, gram-negative coccus and gram-negative rod. All of these are bacteria. This means bactericidal, meaning that the medication will kill the bacteria. Bacteria means bacteria. Cidal means killer, as in homicide and suicide. But this means that the medication is bacteriostatic. It's not gonna kill the bacteria, but it will hinder its replication. This clam means chlamydia. This symbol means that the medication is a liver enzyme inducer, meaning inducer of the P450 liver enzyme system, also known as liver microsomal enzyme. But this means that the medication is a liver enzyme inhibitor, which means it's an inhibitor of the P450 system. When you are a P450 inducer, you will stimulate the metabolism breakdown of other medications, so they will last shorter. But if you are a P450 inhibitor, you will inhibit the metabolism or degradation of other medications. So the other medications will last longer, causing more toxicities. This means neuropathy. This is myopathy or pathology in the muscles. Some medications cause muscle weakness. This means myelosuppression or suppression of the bone marrow. Myelo means core. The bone marrow is in the core of the bone. This means the medication is given via infusion. This means that the medication causes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or GI distress. Whenever a professor asks you, hey, what are the side effects of this specific medication, whatever the medication might be, 
And if you have not studied well, you have no idea how to answer, just say nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and in 99% of cases, you would be correct because many medications cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. This means that the medication is ototoxic. This symbol means that the medication causes cardiac arrest. This means heart block or bradycardia. This means that the medication causes hypotension. This is upper respiratory tract infections. And this is again is myelosuppression. Now, what is pharmacokinetics? What your body does to the drug. And what does my body do to the drug? It is Adam spelled funny. What is this? A-D-M-E. The A is absorption. D is distribution. M is metabolism or degradation. E is excretion or elimination. But pharmacodynamics is the opposite. It's what the drug does to your body and not what your body does to the drug. The way I remembered is that pharmacodynamics is what that drug does to the body. Pharmacokinetics, what your body does to the drug. A, D, M, E. Absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination. What does absorption mean? Absorption means that the drug is going to reach your body by passing through a barrier, by passing through a membrane. If the drug was here and then passed through a membrane and now it was able to reach your blood supply or vascular system, then this process is called absorption. But remember, you have to pass a membrane in order to be absorbed. Famous sites of absorption, your gut or gastrointestinal system. And that's why we take oral medications because they will be absorbed through the gut. And also your lungs. And that's why we have inhalers or nebulizers or atomizers. They will be absorbed through the mucous membrane lining your respiratory system. Moreover, the mucosal surface of the mouth can absorb medications. Have you ever heard of people who chew tobacco? How does that work? When you chew tobacco, it will be absorbed through the mucous membrane lining your oral cavity. Next, there are vaginal medications like vaginal suppository. Same thing for the rectal. So all of these are sites of absorption. Next, distribution. What does that mean? Absorption took me to the blood. Distribution will take me from the blood to the tissue. Okay, what kind of tissue? Any cell in your body. Oh. Tissue. Yeah, a tissue is a bunch of cells gathered together. Next, the M is for metabolism. What does that mean? It means that the drug changes from one form to another form. Usually, but not always, the drug starts as active and then it becomes inactive. And this is degradation. For example, let's say that you took acetaminophen or paracetamol or Tylenol. It's the same thing. All right, who's going to metabolize this buddy? The liver will. What does that mean? It means that after the acetaminophen has done its job, which is antipyretic, analgesic, but not anti-inflammatory, after it helped you with the pain, symptoms, etc., and after it has performed its function, now it's time for the liver to degrade it from something active to something inactive, from something that is functional to a piece of trash, and then this piece of trash will be eliminated. Elimination of drugs can occur via the kidney or via the biliary system or the stool. You can pee the drug out or poop the drug out. You can even sweat the drug out, depending on the type of the medication. This is pharmacokinetics. By the way, throughout the rest of this pharmacology playlist, we will talk in great detail about each one of these topics. Pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, or general pharmacology, is covered in 10 videos. Autonomic pharmacology, 15 videos. Neuropharmacology, 20 videos. Cardiac pharmacology, including diuretics, 50 videos. Endocrine pharmacology, 15 videos. Chemotherapy, another 15 videos. Toxicology, 25 videos. Otacoids, 20 videos. And antibiotics, 40 videos. Not just antibacterials, but antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitics as well. You can watch all of these videos in my pharmacology playlist, or you can download them from my website, medicosisperfectionetics.com. Keep in mind that there are two types of medications. There is the lipid-soluble and the water-soluble. The lipid-soluble is water-insoluble, and the water-soluble is lipid-insoluble. Which means if you are soluble in fat, you are not soluble in water. But if you're soluble in water, you will not be soluble in fat. Because oil and water do not mix. 
If you are lipid soluble, you are fat soluble, you are water insoluble, and we call you nonpolar. But if you're water soluble, you are polar, and we call you lipid insoluble. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, please drop some wuta emoji in the comments. Why should I care, pharmacologically speaking? Because your blood is made of plasma, and the plasma is mostly water and some electrolytes. So the blood is water, okay? Which means if you are a medication that happens to be water soluble, you will have no problem floating freely in the blood. You do not need help from anyone because your blood is your land. You like it, you cruise through it. But don't forget that the cell membrane is lipid by layer, meaning the cell membrane is fat. And if you are a water-soluble medication like this, you cannot enter and pass through the lipid bilayer. Access denied because you are water-soluble and the membrane is lipid-soluble, so you're not going to be able to diffuse through it. Now contrast that with a lipid-soluble medication. It is made of lipid and the cell membrane is made of lipid. So of course, the lipid will cruise through the lipid like a sharp knife through warm butter. No pun intended. Your blood is made of plasma and blood cells. The plasma is water with electrolytes and a bunch of plasma proteins. But for the most part, your plasma is water. So if you are water soluble, you float freely in the plasma. But what if I'm lipid soluble? Oh, you are a lipid soluble medication and the plasma is made of water. So you do not mix well. Therefore, if you are a lipid soluble medication, someone else has to carry you on his shoulder. This someone could be albumin or globulin, basically a plasma protein. So if you are water soluble, keep cruising through the blood, no problem. But if you are lipid soluble, someone needs to carry you. And this carrier is a protein carrier, could be albumin or globulin. Which one is more abundant? Albumin. Which one is more big? Globulin. The plasma is water, but the cell membrane is a lipid bilayer. And the cell membrane is made of all kinds of lipids. Phospholipids? Check. Cholesterol? Checks. Other lipids, including sphingolipids? Check. On the distinction between the lipid-soluble medications and the water-soluble medications, Charles Dickens wrote, It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was this winter of despair. Nothing says winter of despair like studying pharmacology for your final exam. Now, I am a lipid-soluble medication. Now what? You cannot float freely in the blood, unfortunately, because the blood is water, okay? So someone has to carry on his shoulder, and this is a plasma protein, all right? However, if you reach the lipid bilayer cell membrane, you can cruise through it like olive oil in butter. No problem whatsoever. Contrast that with a water-soluble medication. In the plasma, float freely. I do not need any help from any plasma protein because I am water-soluble in a water-soluble medium, in a water medium. However, once I reach the cell membrane, I cannot enter. Access denied because I am water-soluble and the membrane is lipid-soluble, so I cannot access. Which means that I need a receptor on the outside and I need a middleman. And this middleman is a connector. It will connect the receptor on the outside with the nucleus on the inside. And this middleman will help me transfer the signal. Please note that if you are a lipid-soluble medication, your receptor will be on the inside because you can cruise through, you can pass through the membrane. So we will put the receptor on the inside. Could be in the cytoplasm, could be in the nucleus, doesn't matter. But if you are a water-soluble medication, your receptor has to be external because you cannot enter. Everything was lipid soluble. Everything was water soluble. It was bound to plasma proteins. It was freely floating in the serum. Its receptor was internal. Its receptor was external. It was genomic action. It was a non-genomic action. It was slowly acting. It was rapidly acting. Why genomic action? Because when you are lipid soluble, your receptor is inside, sometimes in the nucleus. Oh, nucleus has DNA and DNA has genes, genomic. Why did we learn about all of that? In order to understand this glorious slide. If you are a medication that is water soluble, we can give you intravenously because your blood is water and the drug is water soluble. But if the medication is lipid soluble, we cannot give it intravenously. It will be a problem. 
but we can put it on your skin because your skin has cells and the cells have cell membrane, which is lipid by layer, or we can give it orally because it will be absorbed, let's say in your gut, in the intestines and the intestines have cells and these cells have membranes and the membranes are lipid. What determines the solubility of the drug? Water soluble versus lipid soluble and how much? The polarity, the size and the charge. These three factors determine the solubility of the drug, which determines the route of administration, whether intravenous, transcutaneous, or oral. Some medications are more acidic, others are more basic, and acidity or basicity determine whether the medication will be charged or not. If you are charged, we say ionic, which is polar, which is water-soluble. What if the medication is basic and water-insoluble? Well, we can make it react with an acid. Now, acid plus base equals salt plus water. Okay, and this salt will be water soluble. This is called a neutralization reaction. Conversely, if the medication is acidic and water insoluble, you can react it with a base to achieve the same neutralization reaction, which means acid plus base equals salt plus water. Now you converted it into something water soluble. If you have a compound that is protonated, by protonate I mean protons, it has lots of protons, and it's acidic and a cation, which is a positive ion, if you react it with a base, you will neutralize it and release it from its salt. Now it's water insoluble again. And this is how pharmaceutical companies can manipulate the crud out of these medications just by understanding chemistry. And this is why a doctor who does not know chemistry is like a butcher who does not have a knife. What the flip are you doing? Quiz time. Which of the following routes of administration offer the fastest absorption rate? Is it A, oral, B, intramuscular, C, intravenous, D, transdermal, E, inhalational, or F, topical? Please pause the video and let me know the answer in the comments. Some of you said easy medicosis, of course, intravenous. Uh, they have the highest bioavailability, which means the fastest absorption. This is a doofus mistake, and now you're just somebody that I used to know. What's the problem with intravenous? Here is the problem. Look, my friend, this is your vein. Okay. And if I give you a medication in an intravenous fashion, it means that I injected the medication into your vein. Correct. And the medication was released here. Now, did this cross any membranes? No, it did not cross any membrane. But how about the syringe? The syringe is not a living membrane, you freaking piece of melana. What is melana? Melana is the color and consistency of my stools when I have upper gastrointestinal bleeding. But that's a story for another time. Remember, intravenous does not cross membrane. And by definition, absorption is crossing membranes. Intravenous medications do not cross membranes, therefore they are not absorbed. Therefore, they cannot be the fastest absorption rate because they are not absorbed, period. So if I cannot choose intravenous, then what else should I choose? Well, the fastest of the choices left is inhalational. And that's why patients who have bronchial asthma, they can take an inhaler to stop the asthma attack, which tells you that inhalational medications have fast absorption rate. And this is pharmacokinetics, absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination. Let's talk about distribution quickly. Distribution is from the blood to the tissue. What is absorption? Absorption is crossing membrane. You give me a pill, then it's going to cross the membranes in my intestine and it will reach the blood. But if you give me an intravenous drug, it will reach the blood without being absorbed. And then any medication has part of it protein bound, meaning inactive, and free, which is active. Only the free is active. Then we're going to distribute the medication to the tissues. And at the tissues, the medication will have the desired effect or the therapeutic effect. And as Dr. Thomas Sowell said, there are no solutions in life, only trade offs. Every medication in the history of the world has side effects and every surgery has complications. Anyone who says otherwise is lying to you. And after the medication has done its job, it's time to degrade it and eliminate it. And this is pharmacokinetics. Absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination. If you have watched my physiology playlist, you will remember that cell membrane transport is divided into passive and active. Passive means I do not need energy. I do not require ATP. But active does require energy or ATP. Passive happens along the electrochemical gradient. 
from high concentration to low concentration. But active is the opposite, it's against gradient from low to high. Passive transport is also known as diffusion, and we have many types. Simple diffusion, osmosis, which is a simple diffusion for water, and facilitated diffusion, which requires a carrier protein. Simple, no carrier. Osmosis, no carrier. Facilitated, I need a carrier. Medications need to pass across membrane. This is the definition of absorption. This passage could be passive, meaning no energy needed, or active, which requires ATP. The passage of medications could require no carrier or it could require a carrier. The moment you require a carrier protein, you will have structural specificity, competition, and saturation. Structural specificity means the key in the lock model. The drug is the key, the receptor is the lock. When the key binds to the lock, you can turn the key inside the receptor and then the receptor will start to produce the function. Competition, one medication can compete with another medication for the same receptor. Third, saturation, what does that mean? There will come a moment where all of your receptors will be occupied and therefore you will be saturated. And if we draw a graph, it will look like this. In the beginning, the receptors were available, so the more drug you add, the more effect you get until you saturate all of the receptors and then you will level off. You have reached the maximum velocity or Vmax. Which medications will pass faster through a membrane or which medications will be absorbed faster? Lipid soluble will be faster than water soluble for obvious reason because the membrane is lipid by layer, okay? Small molecules faster than large ones, makes sense. Liquids faster than solids and crystalloids faster than colloids. What is crystalloids? Well, if you've watched my chemistry playlist, you will recall that crystalloid is something like sodium chloride. In water. Oh, crystalloid. Oh, got you. So it's like saline solution. That is true. What is colloid? Colloid is something heavy. What do you mean by heavy? Something like a protein. Oh, like albumin? Yes, indeed. So if you have a patient who is bleeding to death in a hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock, and you want to give that patient fluids to save the patient's life, to prevent and avert hypotension. Which one should you give, crystalloids or colloids? Well, you give the faster. Crystalloids act faster, so we give crystalloids, not colloids. So if I ever hear that you gave your patient who is bleeding colloids instead of crystalloids, I will smack your gluteus maximus. What are the factors that affect diffusion, including absorption? There is the equation. Diffusion is directly correlated to delta C, which is the concentration gradient, A, which is the surface area, T, which is the temperature. But diffusion is inversely related to the square root of M, which is the molecular size of the drug, and L, which is the length, meaning the thickness of the membrane. So let's start with the direct proportion first. So there is a direct correlation between concentration gradient and diffusion. The higher the concentration gradient, the greater the diffusion. There is a direct correlation between surface area and diffusion. The higher the surface area, the higher the diffusion. There is a direct correlation with temperature. So the higher the temperature, the greater the diffusion of the medication. But the inverse correlation is molecular size. So if you have a big humongous drug, diffusion will decrease. If the thickness of the membrane is great, diffusion will decrease. Simple diffusion does not require a carrier, so the more you add, the more the diffuse. However, facilitated diffusion, which requires a carrier protein, will give you what? It will give you a ceiling effect. It will give you a Vmax. At this moment, all of your receptors are saturated. So we're done with absorption and distribution. Here's a quick note on metabolism. Metabolism, also known as biotransformation, is a biological transformation. I'm changing from one phase to another. This something to another could be active drug to inactive drug or less active drug. Inactive to active, oh, this is a pro-drug. A pro-drug is a drug that you give in an inactive form and then later your body will activate it. A classic example is isoniazid. Another mode of metabolism is to convert the drug from active to even more active, such as morphine becoming morphine 6-glucouronide. And there is the dreaded metabolism of turning the active into toxic. All of these are examples of 
biotransformation, hashtag metabolism. It's A-D-M-E, absorption, distribution, metabolism, the E is elimination. Elimination, meaning I'm gonna take this inactive drug and dump it. You can dump it into the urine, into the stool, into the bile, you can breathe it out or you can sweat it out. We're done with pharmacokinetics, let's have an introduction on pharmacodynamics. What is pharmacodynamics? What the drug does to your body. Pharmacokinetics is what your body does to the drug. And this is ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination. But pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to your body. This is the drug, this is the receptor in your body. If the drug is water soluble, it cannot pass through the membrane, so the receptor will be on the outside. But if the drug is lipid soluble, the receptor will be on the inside, which could be cytoplasmic or nuclear. And the drug is gonna bind to the receptor like a key in a lock, like a truck in a dock. So pharmacodynamics studies drugs and the receptors and the drug-drug interactions. And then when the drug meets the receptor, what's gonna happen? Just like when Romeo met Juliet. You can open or close a channel, you can stimulate or inhibit a pump, or you can start a genomic action. Genomic means related to DNA. Because if the drug is lipid soluble, its receptor will be on the inside near the nucleus, and the nucleus has genes. How much does the drug and the receptor love one another is called affinity. This is the main drug. This is an agonist to that drug. What does that mean? Agonist means just like you. If you are going to increase the heart rate, then I will increase the heart rate as well. I have the same effect as you. We share the same receptor, we produce the same effect. But what's an antagonist? Unfortunately, many students think that the antagonist will do the opposite effect. But that's not correct. For example, some students think that if the agonist is gonna raise my heart rate, then the antagonist will lower my heart rate. Nuh uh. The truth is that the agonist binds to the same receptor or another receptor, producing no effect. Zero. Not the opposite. But hey, medicosis, wait a second. I know that beta agonists are going to raise the heart rate and beta antagonists will lower the heart rate. How did that happen? Well, beta blockers did not lower the heart rate per se. What beta blockers did is that they got bound to the same receptor, blocking the receptor. This is a beta receptor which belongs to the sympathetic nervous system. So now the sympathetic is blocked. But you know who is not blocked? Parasympathetic nervous system is not blocked. So the parasympathetic nervous system will have the upper hand because you inhibited the sympathetic. Now the parasympathetic is the only game in town lowering the heart rate. So what actually lowered the heart rate is not the beta blocker, but the parasympathetic function that predominates when you block the sympathetic receptor. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the French toast you're talking about. So here's a full agonist. We'll give you 100% of the desired effect. Partial agonist, ah, let's say 50%. Something between zero and 100. What's an antagonist? Do not say a negative number. No, oh, antagonist will give you zero. It means no effect. If you want something that causes the negative or the opposite effect, it's called inverse agonist or super antagonist. If up here is a positive value, then down here is a negative. And I'm going towards the negative. So antagonist means zero effect, okay? Then you have full agonist, which gives you plus one, which is 100%. Partial agonist between the zero and the one. Inverse partial agonist between the zero and the negative one. And inverse full agonist or super antagonist, negative one. Now to learn about efficacy and potency, please refer to my video titled Pharmacodynamics. You will find it in this pharmacology playlist. This concludes our introduction to general pharmacology, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. You can learn more by downloading my general pharmacology course on my website. It comes with 10 videos, 10 notes, questions and answers, and my perfect Schneider's ultimate notebook. In this course, I've presented many problems and their solutions, questions and answers. Next, an introduction to the autonomic nervous system. What does autonomic mean? It means automatic. It means involuntary. Autonomic, automatic. By the way, I have an introduction video for every branch in medicine. If you have watched my introduction to neuroanatomy video, which is part of my neuroanatomy playlist, you will remember that the nervous system is divided into somatic and autonomic. Somatic means voluntary. 
Autonomic means automatic, involuntary, somatic, something you can control, but autonomic, something that you cannot control. Each one is further subdivided into motor and sensory, and this is true for the autonomic as well. If you ask the average student, or doctor for that matter, what is the autonomic nervous system, what are the components of the autonomic nervous system, they will say with confidence, sympathetic and parasympathetic, that's it. As if the enteric nervous system has left the chat. Don't forget the enteric nervous system, it's part of the autonomic, autonomic for your gut. It's made of the myenteric plexus for motility and the submucosal plexus for secretions. You can learn more about the enteric nervous system in my physiology playlist. Sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Here we have the sympathetic autonomic nervous system and on the other side parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic is fight flight, parasympathetic rest and digest, sympathetic thoracolumbar, but parasympathetic craniosacral. Sympathetic is fight flight when you're running from a tiger, but parasympathetic is rest and digest, eat, read, and take a dump. It's not just a dump, it's urination and defecation. It's time you relax your sphincters. Sympathetic nervous system, you are running from a tiger. When you're running from a tiger, what should happen to your heart rate? Your heart rate should go up. What should happen to the force of contraction of the heart? It should go up. What should happen to your bronchi? They should widen and dilate to breathe more because you are running from a tiger. What should happen to your skeletal muscles? We should supply them with more blood by dilating the vessels that reach the muscles. What's gonna happen to your kidney? It will release renin. What's gonna happen to your adrenal medulla? It will release epinephrine and norepinephrine. All of these will raise your blood pressure and you need it when you're running from a tiger. Also, your pupils will dilate in order to see more of your surroundings. Your lens will become more flat, flat for far vision. Your spleen, which is a blood organ, will squeeze itself, pushing its blood out, increasing the blood volume in the peripheral circulation to supply your muscle more and your heart more, etc. As for your colon and your urinary bladder, well, think about it. If you are running from a tiger, do you want to pee and poop? No! No one has time for this nonsense. So you relax the wall and constrict the sphincter for the colon and for the bladder. But parasympathetic is the exact opposite. It is rest and digest, eat, read, and take a dump. Your bronchi will constrict, your eyes will constrict to allow you to read the book better because there is a lot of light in the room reflecting to your eye, making it harder to read. So that's why you need to constrict the pupil. Your lens will become more spherical, accommodating for near vision. You are eating, so you'll secrete lots of saliva. You are digesting, so your bowel will contract its wall and relax its sphincter to allow you to poop. Same thing for the urethra. Relax the sphincter, allow you to pee. What's the effect of the parasympathetic on the male organ? It points. Hashtag erection. What's the function of the sympathetic nervous system when it comes to the male organ? Shoot and shrink. The S with the S. Hashtag ejaculation. If you want to learn more about the effect of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic and the receptors on the urinary bladder muscles and the urethra, please refer to my video titled Urinary Bladder Pharmacology, which you can find in this pharmacology playlist. This is your brain and spinal cord. We call them central nervous system. There are some nerves that will supply skeletal muscles. These are cholinergic nerves. Why do you call them cholinergic? Because they secrete acetylcholine. And what's the name of the receptor on the skeletal muscle? Nicotinic sub M. M for muscle. This was somatic, meaning voluntary. But now let me tell you about autonomic or involuntary. One is parasympathetic, the second is sympathetic. You have a ganglion, and before the ganglion, preganglionic fiber. After the ganglion, another fiber called postganglionic. If you are parasympathetic, you are cholinergic in the preganglionic because you release acetylcholine, and you are cholinergic postganglionic because you also release acetylcholine. But there is a difference on the receptors. On the ganglion, it's nicotinic sub N, N for nerve. But on the smooth muscles, we have muscarinic receptors. If you are sympathetic, preganglionic, the same as parasympathetic. Acetylcholine, so cholinergic. 
But post-ganglionic is adrenergic. Why? Because they release noradrenaline or norepinephrine. And the receptors are alphas and betas. If you are running from a tiger, you need to dilate the pupil. This happens through the sympathetic alpha-1 receptors. So if you give me a medication that is alpha-1 agonist, it will dilate the pupil, hashtag midriasis. Conversely, the parasympathetic is rest and digest. I want to constrict the pupil. And this happens by constrictor pupillae muscle, which has M3 muscarinic receptors. So if you give me a muscarinic agonist, what do you think is going to happen to my pupil? My pupil will constrict, hashtag meiosis. You can learn more about the alpha agonist and antagonist, beta agonist and antagonist, muscarinic agonist antagonist, the nicotinics, the muscarinics, sympathomimetics, sympatholytics, parasympathomimetics, parasympatholytics, and all of this doozy stuff when you download my autonomic pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. Next, introduction to neuropharmacology. For the pros, glutamate and aspartate are excitatory neurotransmitters, but GABA and glycine are inhibitory neurotransmitters. This is your neuron. When something positive enters into the neuron, we call this depolarization, which is activation of the neuron. But what do you think is going to happen when something negative enters? Oh, the opposite. If the entry of the positive is activation, then the entry of the negative is inactivation or hyperpolarization. Okay, let's think about the following. If the positive entry is activation, what do you think is going to happen when the positive leaves? Inactivation or hyperpolarization. There are many medications that work by opening chloride channels in your brain, leading chloride to enter into the neuron. Chloride is negative. When it enters, the inside becomes more negative and the neuron is inactivated and inhibited. Such is the mechanism of action of the sedatives and hypnotics. These medications calm you down. They inhibit your brain by acting on GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. How do these sedatives and hypnotics work? They tell the GABA receptor, which is a complex receptor like this, to open its chloride channel. Now the chloride will rush into the neuron. Chloride is negative. The inside of the neuron will be more negative. Hashtag hyperpolarization or inactivation, which is sedation and hypnosis when your brain is inhibited. Examples of medications that work by this mechanism include benzodiazepines and barbiturates. Next, how does morphine work? It has a bunch of mechanisms. Here is one of them. Morphine, which is an opioid, is going to act on a GI-coupled receptor. By the way, I means inhibition, and G because it's GTP related. And once the morphine binds to its receptor, guess what's going to happen? Potassium channel will open and potassium will leave the chat. When the positive is leaving, the inside will become more negative. Hashtag inhibition. And this is how morphine and opioids inhibit pain. You can learn about opioids, anesthetics, general and local. Stimulants, sedatives and hypnotics, anti-epileptics, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and anti-Parkinsonian medications when you download my neuropharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. We have covered this, 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 and this. Let's have an introduction to cardiac pharmacology. Sometimes the heart has arrhythmia, so we have antiarrhythmics. Sometimes you have hypertension, so we have medications to lower the blood pressure. And to lower the blood pressure, you also need to tell the kidney to pee more in order to lose more fluid and lower my blood pressure. These are diuretics. Sometimes I get angina. Oh, chest pain. So we have anti-anginal medications. Sometimes I have hyperlipidemia and hypercholesterolemia. So we have lipid-lowering agents. Sometimes my heart muscle is weak and I have congestive heart failure, systolic failure. What should I do? Give me a medication to boost cardiac contractility. These are called positive anotropes. In other cases, my heart rate is high. What do I do? Give me medications to lower the heart rate. These are called negative chronotropes. You know what a chronic disease is? It's a disease that takes a long time. So chrono means time. Oh, time per minute. Beats per minute. So when something decreases the number of beats per minute, it's a negative chronotropic. But when a drug raises my heart rate, it's a positive chronotropic. 
Let me give you an example of a positive eonotrope which boosts cardiac contractility and this is the famous digoxin which is a member of the family of the digitalis medication. How does it work? It inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase. The sodium potassium ATPase, may it rest in peace, used to kick the sodium out and kick the potassium in. But now it's not working because digoxin inhibited it, which means sodium will not leave. And if sodium did not leave, it will not enter. And if sodium did not enter, calcium will not leave. It's positive for positive exchange. And when calcium cannot leave, calcium will pile up inside the heart muscle. All of this is the cardiac muscle. Calcium will release his friends from jail. What's the jail? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is called calcium-induced calcium release. Calcium is the here of contraction. So your heart will contract more. This is a positive enotrope. In this pharmacology playlist, there are 50 videos that will teach you about anti-hyperlipidemics, anti-arrhythmics, anti-anginal medications, anti-hypertensives, diuretics, and the toxin. Next, introduction to endocrine pharmacology. What is the endocrine system? First, the word endo means what? Into. Into what? Into the blood. Oh, so when you have a cell secreting something directly into the bloodstream, it's called endocrine. And for my A students, it's not just blood. It could be lymph as well. That's endocrine. Think of the endocrine system as a company. There is a chief executive officer on top, followed by general managers, underneath which we find employees which work for the company and must obey the managers. We also have independent contractors, which do not belong to the company. And that's why they do not respect the managers whatsoever. They might say sweet nothings to their ears just to kiss their gluteus maximus, but they do not obey the managers. Your body works the same way. What is the CEO of the endocrine system? This is the hypothalamus, okay? And what is the general manager? when it comes to the endocrine system, it's called the anterior pituitary. Then we have three employees that have to listen to the pituitary and three independent contractors that do not listen to the pituitary. What are the three employees that have to listen to the pituitary? Number one, thyroid gland. Number two, adrenal cortex. Number three, the gonads, ovaries in females and testes in males. But what are the three independent contractors that do not obey the pituitary? Instead of thyroid, say parathyroid. Instead of adrenal cortex, say adrenal medulla. And instead of gonads, say pancreas. This is the hypothalamus, which is the CEO. This is the anterior pituitary, which is the general manager. This anterior pituitary secretes growth hormone, prolactin, TSH for the thyroid, which is an employee, ACTH for the adrenal cortex, another employee, FSH and LH for the gonads, the third employee. As for the posterior pituitary, it does not synthesize anything from scratch. It just borrows some hormones from the hypothalamus. What kind of hormones? ADH and oxytocin. The anterior pituitary is called the adenohypophysis, whereas the posterior pituitary is called neurohypophysis. Why is this? Because the anterior pituitary is a true gland. Adeno means gland. It truly synthesizes these hormones from scratch. But the posterior pituitary is not a true gland. It's just a nervous pathway that is connected to the hypothalamus and it borrows the hormones that the hypothalamus made, hence neurohypophysis. What does hypophysis mean? It means growth under the brain because the pituitary is a growing part under your brain. This is the hypothalamus or the CEO. This is the anterior pituitary and this is the posterior pituitary. When the hypothalamus wants the pituitary to make growth hormone, the hypothalamus will secrete growth hormone releasing hormone to stimulate the anterior pituitary to secrete growth hormone. Growth hormone tells the liver to make IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1. Together, the growth hormone and the IGF-1 will help you um, grow. That's why it's called growth hormone. What if the hypothalamus wants the pituitary not to secrete growth hormone? Then the hypothalamus will secrete somatostatin. Somatostatin is a universal inhibitor. Statin from static not moving. Oh yeah, I do not want the growth hormone to be secreted. Somatostatin is a universal inhibitor. It inhibits everything. It even inhibits its own secretion. It's a doofus and it comes from that delta cell. Delta, doofus. 
Next, when the hypothalamus secretes gonadotropin-releasing hormone, the pituitary will listen and make gonadotropins, such as FSH and LH. These gonadotropins will tell the gonads to make testosterone in males, estrogen, progesterone in females. When the hypothalamus makes thyrotropin-releasing hormone, the pituitary listens and secretes thyrotropin, which is TSH, or thyroid-stimulating hormone. Guess what? The thyroid-stimulating hormone is a hormone that stimulates the thyroid gland. And when the thyroid gland in front of your neck gets stimulated, it releases thyroid hormone, or T4 and T3. When the hypothalamus makes corticotropin-releasing hormone, the anterior pituitary responds by making ACTH, or adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is a hormone that is going to grow the adrenal cortex, which is exactly what happens. Now, the adrenal cortex, not medulla, will respond by secreting tons of cortisol and androgen. But where is aldosterone? Well, aldosterone is not mainly stimulated by ACTH, but it's stimulated by renin. And to learn more about this, please refer to my video titled The Renin and Dutensin Aldosterone System, which you can find in my physiology playlist. Next, the hypothalamus can secrete TRH. Oh, the same TRH as this, precisely. And this will stimulate the release of prolactin from the anterior pituitary gland. Prolactin is prolactation. It produces milk from the mammary glands. But what if the hypothalamus does not want the anterior pituitary to secrete prolactin? Then the hypothalamus will make dopamine. Dopamine will inhibit the release of prolactin. So we can think of dopamine as a prolactin inhibiting hormone or a prolactin inhibiting factor. And that's it for the anterior pituitary. For the pros, notice the red color. These red squares tell you that these cells are acidophils, which secrete growth hormone and or prolactin. But look at this blue color. These are basophils inside the anterior pituitary to make gonadotropins, to make TSH and ACTH. We're done with the anterior pituitary. How about the posterior pituitary? The posterior pituitary does not make any hormone from scratch, but it borrows from the hypothalamus. It borrows the ADH from the supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus, and it borrows oxytocin mainly from the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. To learn more about the different nuclei of the hypothalamus and their functions, please refer to my neuroanatomy playlist. I have a video about the thalamus and a video about the hypothalamus that are epic. Now, what does that have to do with pharmacology? Everything. There is something called hormone replacement therapy, which is an umbrella term that means Basically, that the patient cannot make enough of a certain hormone, so therefore you are replacing it. We are giving the patient exogenous hormones from the outside. One famous example is estrogen after menopause. We can give the patient estrogen, and this is hormone replacement therapy. Therefore, you need to know the physiological effects of estrogen, because if you know them, you can predict the pharmacological effects of estrogen. They are similar, but not identical. You can learn more about the endocrine system in my physiology playlist. You can learn about endocrine pharmacology in this pharmacology playlist. I also have a video on the dopamine neural pathways, which will teach you about the different pathways of dopamine, such as the nigrostriatal pathway, the mesocortical, the mesolimbic, and the tuberoinfundibular. Because dopamine has different functions in different parts of the brain. You can watch this video in this pharmacology playlist. Quick note on the thyroid versus the parathyroid gland. Thyroid has two types of cells, follicular and parafollicular. The follicular is the follicles. Oh, the follicles, the cells of the follicles will make what? They will make T3 and T4. They will make thyroid hormone. But the parafollicular, which are parallel to the follicular cells, are here. They are interstitial cells, so to speak, because they are interdispersed between the thyroid follicles. They are clear cells, so we call them C cells, and they secrete C, calcitonin. So follicular cells, T3 and T4. Parafollicular cells, calcitonin. How about the parathyroid, which is parallel to the thyroid? These parathyroid glands have chief cells and oxfil cells. What's the function of the chief cells? They are the chief cells. They are the main cells, the principal cells. So they make parathyroid hormone because this is the parathyroid gland. And please remember that the parathyroid hormone wants to increase your serum calcium. But the parathyroid hormone is also a phosphate trashing hormone. So it decreases serum phosphate. 
Next, the difference between the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. The adrenal cortex is mesodermal in origin, but the adrenal medulla is ectodermal in origin. It came from the neural ectoderm, particularly from the neural crest cells, which migrate all over the body. The adrenal cortex will make mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, and adrenal androgens, but the adrenal medulla will make catecholamines, which include three things, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Epinephrine is the same as adrenaline, and and norepinephrine is the same as noradrenaline. You can learn more about thyroid hormone, about the types of insulin and the doses of insulin for patients with diabetes. You can learn about cortisol. You can learn about estrogen, progesterone, androgen, and all of this lovely stuff by downloading my endocrine pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. All my courses come with videos, notes, and cases. And the cases are answered, of course. Next, introduction to chemotherapy. What is chemo? Well, you need to understand the cell cycle first. G is for growth. You have a G1 and a G2 phase. S is for synthesis. Synthesis of what? Synthesis of DNA. Oh, you want to copy the DNA. Yeah, we call this DNA replication. And what is the M for? M is for mitosis. Oh, the actual cell division. When one cell becomes two. So, G0 is resting phase, then G1 is growth, I'm preparing, preparing for what? For synthesis, okay? Let's make another copy of the DNA. So I started with one, now I have two, because I want one cell to divide into two. So I better get the DNA ready. Then grow some more, to prepare for what? To prepare for mitosis, which is the actual cell division. When it comes to chemotherapy or anti-cancer medications, we divide them into cell cycle specific and cell cycle non-specific. Cell cycle specific will target certain phases of the cell cycle. For example, the following classes of medication target the S phase. These are the anti-metabolites, the epipodophytotoxins, and the chemtothicin analogs, who named these things. So if I'm taking one of these medications, say goodbye to the S phase, which means that the cancer cells will not divide. But you know what? My own cells will also not divide. Which of my own cells divide the fastest? my hair. So I get hair loss. That's why patients on chemotherapy lose their hair. What else? My gastrointestinal linings. Oh, the epithelium. Oh, that's going to be shedded a lot. I will have diarrhea all the time. What else divides fast? Uh, bone marrow cells? Sure. So I get what? Pancytopenia, anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. Next, medications that target the G2 phase include bleomycin. Medications that target the M phase include the vinca alkaloids and the taxanes. Then we have a cell cycle nonspecific. So yeah, they kill cancer cells, but they do not target a specific cycle phase. And these include all the following. So the anti-cancer drugs or the chemotherapeutic agents are many. They include anti-metabolites, alkylating agents, plant alkaloids, antibiotic chemotherapy, hormones, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, and miscellaneous. You can learn about them all by downloading my anti-cancer pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. Or if you do not want to download, you can simply watch the anti-cancer pharmacology lectures in this pharmacology playlist on YouTube. Next, toxicology introduction. It is the study of toxins. Let's say that we're discussing the joxin toxicity, for example. So what is happening? For example, we had a patient with congestive heart failure, took the joxin, took too much, and then suffered side effects. What are the symptoms and signs of the side effects? And then how can we manage this case? There is general management, there is special management. General is for everybody. In emergency medicine, you always start with your ABCs. Airway, breathing, and circulation. And then we have special management, which is the antidote, if we have an antidote for a specific medication. If you know the name of the antidote for the joxin, please comment below. Many toxidromes cause acidosis. And if you are a physiology buff, you will recall that acidosis inhibits synaptic transmission. So this neuron will be unable to talk to the next neuron. And the patient will suffer from what? The patient will be tired all the time, drowsy, uptunded, somnolent, etc. Aspiration is evil, so you need to protect your patient from aspiration. The Glasgow Coma Scale is important. And you need to know by heart the medications with a narrow therapeutic window. Many agents produce protons in your body, which causes acidosis. In addition to your normal day-to-day -day metabolism, which also secretes protons. 
acid-base imbalances in humans include respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis versus metabolic alkalosis. So you have four conditions. Then the metabolic acidosis is divided into HAGMA or NAGMA. This is high anion gap metabolic acidosis, and this is normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. As for the metabolic alkalosis, it's divided into two types, saline responsive and saline resistant. Let's review aspiration. Who is at risk of aspiration or aspiration pneumonia? Well, aspiration is what? Is when something that should not be in the lungs ends up in your lungs. People who are susceptible to aspiration include, but not limited to, anyone with a weak cough reflex. What do I mean by this? The very old, the unconscious, the neuro patient. What do you mean? Maybe a brain disease, like a brainstem lesion. Swallowing and coughing, all of these require centers in the brain. And if these are disrupted, problems can happen. The patient who is intoxicated, because many medications inhibit the breathing center in the medulla of the brain. Next, the intubated patient is at risk of aspiration. We call this iatrogenic. Genic means genesis of iatro. Who is that? Healer. Oh, healer induced, which is a polite way of saying my doctor was a doofus. The Glasgow Coma Scale was discussed in a separate video in my emergency medicine playlist, but here's the rule. If the score is less than 8, it is time to intubate. The Glasgow Coma Scale ranges from 3 to a score of 15. There is no such thing as a Glasgow Coma Scale of 0, or 1, or 2. It's impossible. If your doctor tells you that your Glasgow Coma Scale is 2, find another doctor immediately. Next, the medications with a narrow therapeutic window include, but not limited to, digoxin, warfarin, lithium, iron, theophylline, colchicine, methotrexate, and emuterone. What does that mean? What does narrow therapeutic index mean? It means that the distance between the minimum effective concentration and the maximum toxic concentration, this delta is narrow. Okay, so it means what? That between the effective dose and the toxic dose is an inch. In other words, it's very easy to overdose on one of these medications, which means toxicity is more likely, so be very careful with these medications. The ABCs of emergency medicine, A is airway, B is for breathing, and C is circulation. You can also add a D for drugs and T for temperature. And here is a song for emergency medicine and toxicology. For acute mental status change of unknown etiology, Narcan, dextrose, thiamine, for you and me. Any patient who has acute mental status and you have no idea what's going on, you need to give Narcan because the patient could be a heroin addict. This could be morphine intoxication. Dextrose, because the patient could be hypoglycemic in a hypoglycemic coma, so you give dextrose. Thiamine, which is vitamin B1, because the patient could be an alcoholic. Alcoholic patients usually have a deficiency in vitamin B1, so you give vitamin B1. If your patient is alcoholic and you gave dextrose without thiamine, I will smite your gluteus maximus. This is a fatal mistake. You should always give thiamine. And I've talked about this in detail in my biochemistry playlist. And you can learn more about adrenergic toxicity and cholinergic toxicity, toxicity of beta blockers and toxicity of digoxin, lithium toxicity, theophylline toxicity, amiodarone toxicity, toxicity of heparin and warfarin, and much, much more. Learn about all of this by downloading my toxicology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com or you can watch my toxicology videos in this pharmacology playlist. Next, introduction to otacoids. What does that even mean? Oid means like. So we have cancer and carcinoid, which is cancer-like. We have andro, which means a man. And android, it's a robot that looks like a man. And that's why the logo of android operating system for your phone is a humanoid robot. You didn't know that, did you? I have received some secret information from Google that they are planning on developing a feminist vision of the android and they will name it gynecoid and it will be a female robot. So oid means like. How about the Oteco part? Well, it's from akos, which means remedy. Oh, like remedy. Otacoids basically deals with paracrine and autocrine stuff. Paracrine is when the cell secretes something to influence the surrounding, the parallel paracrine, okay? What is autocrine? Autocrine is when the cell secretes something to act on the same cell because the word autos means self as in automatic or autonomy. So that was otacoids. How about icosinoids? Icosa is 20, oid means like. 
because these are products of the metabolism of the famous arachidonic acid, which has 20 carbons. Otacoids and eicosanoids deal with the study of prostaglandins, thromboxane E2, leukotrienes, and more. Remember that the prostaglandins and leukotrienes are derivatives of the arachidonic acid metabolism. And then the prostaglandins will give us thromboxane E2, which is procoagulation, and prostacyclin, which keeps the blood cycling because it's anticoagulation. Otacoids is the umbrella term, and eicosanoid is a subset of otacoids. To learn more about the arachidonic acid pathway and the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes and the cyclooxygenase versus lipooxygenase and more, I have a video in this pharmacology playlist titled Arachidonic Acid Pathway. One of the best videos that I've ever uploaded because I probably recorded that video when I was under the influence of some high quality apples and bananas. You can delve deeper into the topic of otacoid pharmacology by downloading my otacoids pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. It will teach you about cyclic EMP, serotonin, gastrointestinal pharmacology, including the treatment of peptic ulcer disease, treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and the famous DMARDs, treatment of asthma and COPD, treatment of cystic fibrosis, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and much more. You can also watch these otacoid pharmacology videos in this pharmacology playlist. Next, an introduction to antibiotics. There is a slight difference between antibiotics and antibacterials. I love the word or the term antibacterials better because antibacterials just tells me that I am antibacterials. And antibiotics will buy you means life. So technically this means anti-life. So it could target bacteria, fungi, parasites, etc. But when doctors say antibiotics, they usually mean antibacterials. So what is a more inclusive term that includes antibacterials, antifungals, antivirals, and antiparasitic medications? Just call them antimicrobials. This is an umbrella term that includes everything. The antibacterials, the antivirals, the antifungals, and the antiparasitic medications. These antimicrobials include antibacterials, antifungals, antivirals, and antiparasitic medications. Keep in mind that when a medication ends in azole, the odds are it's an antifungal. And if a medication ends in vir, as in acyclovir, it's an antiviral. Beta-lactam describes an antibiotic that kills bacteria, but beta glucan is a structure of a fungus. We divide bacteria into gram-staining and non-gram-staining organisms. If you are gram-staining, it means that you acquire this stain really well because you have a very thick peptidoglycan cell wall. But if you cannot retain the purple, you will stain pink and we'll call you gram-negative, cocci and rods. Then we have other bacteria. They are anatomically gram-positive, but in reality, they do not stain that well with gram. These include the mycobacteria, which does not stain well with gram. That's why we need to rely on the acid-fast stain, such as zeal Nielsen. And mycoplasma, this is a weird one because this does not have a cell wall. So, of course, in the lab, it will not retain the gram stain. In pharmacology, there is synergy, there is additive effect, could be for a good thing or for a bad thing, and there is the antagonist effect. Antagonist does not mean negative, antagonist means zero. Give me an example of synergy. Okay, penicillin plus aminoglycosides, together they work like crazy. Or medications to treat tuberculosis, isoniazid plus rifampin plus streptomycin will give you a synergistic effect. What is synergy? Synergy means one plus one equals three, which is a mathematical insanity, but a pharmacological reality. So the net effect is greater than the sum of its parts. Next, additive effects, one plus one equals two. It could be for a good thing, such as combining ciprofloxacin with metronidazole, or it could be for a bad thing, such as uh, the toxicity to the ear if you take loop diuretics and aminoglycosides together. Say goodbye to your ear. Are you talking about the cochlear apparatus or the vestibular apparatus in the ear? I'm talking about both. This combination is ugly. We have antagonists as well, penicillin and tetracycline. Combining penicillin plus tetracycline is pointless. So antimicrobials could be antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, or antiparasitic. Then the antibacterials are divided into cell wall synthesis inhibitors or cell membrane disruptors. So two groups here. Protein synthesis inhibitors could inhibit the 30S or the 50S. And nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors, whether direct acting or indirect acting. We've talked about all of this in detail in my famous antibiotics course, which has 40 videos and questions and cases with answers, of course. 
and a mind map to help you memorize these medications. And all of this is combined in a Perfectionist Ultimate Notebook, which is just a wonderful PDF to have. Download this course today at medicosisperfectionalis.com. After learning all of this, hopefully you're now pumped and ready to learn about pharmacology. Maybe you will be the author of the next edition of the Pharmacopia. So you can go to my website to download these courses or you can watch these videos in the pharmacology playlist. I have general pharmacology course, autonomic pharmacology, another for CNS pharmacology, another for cardiac pharmacology, including diuretics, another for endocrine pharmacology, including the doses of insulin and how to calculate the dose, chemotherapy, toxicology, otacoids and eicosanoids, and the lovely lectures of antibiotics. Every one of these courses comes with videos, notes, and cases. If you value what I do, help me make more videos, support the channel by going to buymeacoffee.com slash medicosis. There are more than 600 premium videos available on this channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo, Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine, chemistry, math, and physics make perfect sense.